Mr. Reggie Kumar Pillai, thank you so much uh, for speaking to India Global Business. It's a pleasure to be speaking with you. Uh, I was going through your bio, uh, Mr. Pillai, and you have done such exhaustive work throughout your career. And you have worn so many hats and enacted so many roles. But I just thought I would probably uh, keep the introduction very uh, short and simple by basically saying that at the moment, you're the president of the India Smart Grid Forum since its inception in 2011. And you are also the chairman of the Global Smart Grid Federation since November 2016. You have done a lot of exhaustive work uh, throughout your career, Mr. Pillai. So I wanted to basically start off by asking you that as an internationally renowned expert with over three decades of experience, in the electricity sector and where you have covered diverse roles across the entire value chain and across various continents. What are the key takeaways and lessons that you have garnered from your experiences? Thank you very much for the kind words and the introduction and also inviting me for this uh, interview. Uh, I've been very fortunate, I must say, to work in the electricity sector uh, for almost four decades now. I, or, and entire value chain from generation of electricity from uh, thermal power plants, that's where I started my career to in between I had opportunity to work in hydro as well as in renewables now and to transmission, high voltage transmission, high voltage direct current transmission uh, to distribution and consumption. And now storage has also become a very important component of the entire value chain. So I've been fortunate to work in all these areas a hands-on in different parts of the world from India, South Asia to Southeast Asia to Middle East to uh, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa and to North America. And also had had opportunity to interact closely on this various aspect with policymakers, uh, innovators of technology, as well as uh, in industry leaders from all over the world. So I, to your question, I must say that the biggest issues around the world are access, access to quality electricity, availability of it, affordability of it, and reliability of it are the key issues. In many parts of the world still, we have close to a billion people without uh, access to electricity. We have more than a couple of billions who do not have a reliable uh, and uh, available 24 7 24 7 electricity available which is quality power and also a large sections of the society who cannot afford for it so we have a lot of work ahead of us in the coming decades where today for less than one uh, pound i mean less than one uh, cent pound per kilowatt hour or 1.2 or 1.3 dollar cent per kilowatt hour we can generate from solar energy. The latest uh, bits which you have received in Portugal, in Chile, in Middle East this year are all somewhere around one rupee in Indian rupee, one rupee per kilowatt hour is the generation cost from solar. And you saw the storage today, maybe around 50% more than that, but by 2025, that will also forecast to be in almost in that range. So one rupee for one unit of electricity for generation from solar and one rupee for storage for that. In two rupees, if we can give electricity, reliable supply of electricity, and that is something which is affordable. And that is something which will change the life of billions of people around the world. We need to work towards that. So any standby arrangement today, the grid, the electricity from the grid is the cheapest electricity. And among all the fuels at the user end, electricity is the cleanest fuel. If any other substitute you use have uh, some form of emission or the other. And uh, any, any alternate arrangement than grid power is much more expensive. And the biggest thing I had realized over the years is that the poor people, the poor man spend a disproportionate share of his income in for his energy needs. For the rich, it is not even 1%. 1% 1 
a man who's earned 200 rupees a day, he spent 10 rupees or 20 rupees a day for his electricity needs, even 5 to 10 rupees for even charging his cell phone. That is a cruelty. So we should be able to give them clean electricity at reliably at affordable rate, which is possible with today's technology. We are not talking about any new technology which need to be uh, invented. Today's proven technology can do that. It is only adoption and scale up and all stakeholders coming on the common platform to make it happen. That's really interesting, uh, Mr. Pillai, uh, when you talked about the common man. Now, the common man, as you know, he does not really pay a lot of close attention to government statutes, government regulations. He looks at life very simplistically, where he just wants to come home uh, and put on the switch and get electricity or find power in a profession of his that uh, allows electricity uh, to be used for it. Uh, you have been um, pretty much involved in the Right to Electricity Act in India that ensures a lifeline supply of electricity to citizens in the country. Uh, in your uh, vast experience, do you think that this will become a reality one day? It's going to be very soon. Uh, we have spent billions of dollars to take the grid. Uh, when we gained independence in 1947, electricity was there only in very few towns. Uh, we had 1,360 megawatt of total generation capacity for close to 400 million people. That is what was in 1947. When I started my career early 1980s, we had something close to 30,000 megawatt in the country. And today we are as we talk, it's about 373,000 megawatt. 373 gigawatt, India as the third largest power system. And we also have the complete the Indian continent on one grid, one nation, one grid. Almost 300 million customers, this 373 gigawatt of generation capacity and 3 million square kilometers of the Indian continent on one frequency. That's a great achievement which you have done. And now almost 30% uh, of it is coming from, uh, I mean, the capacity is from renewable energy. In the last 10 years, we have added about 80,000 megawatt of renewable energy. In terms of energy, it's about 21 to 22 percentage. In terms of capacity, we are somewhere around 30 percentage. And our energy, consumption from renewable by 2030, we set a target of 40% from renewable energy and our 80,000 megawatt of renewable energy, we are taking it to 175 gigawatt by 2022. Maybe COVID will have some minor impact, uh, but we set a new target of 450 gigawatt of renewable energy by 2030 in, in accordance with the Paris Agreement to have 30% uh, a reduction of uh, uh, our emissions and 40% total energy consumption from renewables by 2030. So as I said, reliable electricity supply from the for few hours, at least for few hours in the evening hours, that is very, very much required for economic development, social development of the people. I myself born in a house which was not connected to the grid. Until I was in class five, there was no electricity in my home. So we used to use kerosene lamps. So first thing after coming back from school was to clean all those lamps and put uh, kerosene into it and light it. And it was not very pleasant experience uh, studying with the kerosene lamps. And when electricity come to the house or come to a village, the life changes. It is not just light, it's a complete life in the village changes. So some of the things I like to mention, uh, the day get extended. People don't need to sleep 12 hours. So if you have four to six hours electricity, many things which you otherwise do during the day, in the absence of sunlight, uh, we, uh, I mean, in the absence of light, you like to complete during sunlight. Uh, you could postpone it to later as after sunset with electricity to do that. So many income generating activities can be done post sunset with 
electricity light that improve the economic light uh, activities so our is 30 percent income goes up it's true in india it's true in sub-saharan africa i have seen the same thing in southeast asia also with the electrification almost 30 percent of household income goes up because people can do many things during the day and come back and do household course with the light children's education i myself is an example i said uh, you could do better when there is electricity at home children could assist during the day in other activities and also the biggest thing is that in many parts of india we have seen wherever reliable electricity has been given people have invested in pump set and other appliances so that you get drinking water in the village itself otherwise children are pulled out from school to go to villages sorry to far away places to fetch drinking water that could take several hours so particularly it is girl children who are pulled out from uh, school to go to fetch drinking water so we have seen in some cases in gujarat when 24 7 electricity was made available in villages the dropout of children from high school has come down by more than 80 percentage 80 percentage dropout came down when reliable electricity was given in the villages so that people invested in pump set so that potable water is available right there in the village another thing the medical facilities the trucks need to be kept in refrigerated environment in a village where there is no uh, electricity reliable supply of electricity you don't get medicines you have to go to the nearest town maybe 50 kilometers or 100 kilometers to get proper trucks same way you don't have a photocopying facility you don't have a internet you don't have any proper uh, reliable communication you don't have cottage industries to make uh, the rice to powder or to chili to powder to any kind of those agricultural produce you you, you have no me mechanized forms of any in cottage industries in the village nobody will invest unless there is electricity look at dairy in the villages there are cows and buffaloes and all that there are a lot of milk but they cannot do any dairying and uh, process that and sell it uh, any income generating activity for that matter even food which is grown in the villages are a large percentage of it is completely go waste so with and also people's literacy level goes up migration from villages to towns will reduce with reliable electricity and all these facilities which will be locally available and also entertainment facilities goes up and population growth also take a dip in such environment generally because of the awareness goes up there are more recreation activities available so overall life changes in a village with reliable electricity supply that is the very reason even if we cannot provide 24 7 electricity at least we should be able to give lifeline supply of electricity of five to six hours every day evening in every electrified village and we through several focus programs over the decades today we sub generate electricity surplus in india but every houses does it reach no because of the constraints in the transmission and distribution system particularly in the distribution system all the villages over the past two decades we have electrified through some focus program 619000 villages the grid has reached 619000 villages in india we have electrified almost 99% household are connected to the grid but unfortunately still millions of households they don't get electricity every day evening so this is the area where we need to focus and improve the distribution system so that people get that lifeline supply of electricity and they have a right to electricity so now unfortunately the tariff regime in the country is all managed by uh, the, the political economy they think that electricity should be subsidized to the poor people the poor man as i said spend a disproportionately high percentage of his income for his energy needs if he is using kerosene the grid power average all across India, electricity from the grid is anything from four to five rupees per kilowatt hour. And the higher slabs for the 
middle middle income and high income group it may go to 8 or 9 rupees or even commercial and industries it's 8 or 9 rupees but the cost of electricity production and supply is somewhere in the range of 4 to 5 rupees the common the poor man if he is using kerosene for him it is more than 10 rupees if he is using a dg set it is more than 15 rupees per unit of electricity so they are very much willing to pay that 5 rupees or 7 rupees to the electricity distribution companies whereas due to skewed priorities and understanding of the political economy our regulators and our policy makers they want to subsidize electricity to 2 rupees 3 rupees and don't give them end of the day don't get it they have to spend much more to get it from all alternate arrangements which are four times five times more expensive so this is exactly what i have been advocating that people should have a right to get electricity i am prepared to pay the right price of electricity the true cost of electricity to the grid operator to give me at 4 rupees or 5 rupees which is still cheaper than me from than any other alternate arrangement i will pay that please give me that it's a, my right i have a right to ask for that i don't want subsidized i'll pay the cost of supply and give me that this is exactly what we have been advocating for so uh, coming back to you know india is now developing at such a rapid pace we are seeing the birth of smart cities the villages are becoming uh, districts and the economy is firing up on all cylinders and this requires a lot of power and consumption of power and uh, in your uh, experience you may have studied the pitfalls the advantages the benefits and the solutions what is your view of this uh, with regards to consumption of electricity now and how we should harness this uh, in the future uh, that is to come in front of us well as i said we operate the third largest power system in the world with 373 gigawatt of uh, generation capacity but when it comes to per capita consumption of electricity we are somewhere around 1100 to 1200 units or kilowatt hour per person per year which is uh, almost one fourth of the world average so we have a long way to go if you have to be a developed country even you take the urban india it is not more than 2000 uh unit per person per year in the urban india also uh, the electricity consumption so this is need to improve is need to go a big way and uh, the, pro, the the availability is not a constraint of late because the last 10 15 years our generation capacity has gone up but then uh, there are as i said the medium voltage and low voltage grid there are constraint that everybody don't get 24 7 but the smart city the biggest problem the biggest constraint it's a great concept which is uh, launched by the government the most of the 100 smart cities are already uh, the existing cities they are not uh, greenfield cities most of them are uh, the, the existing cities which we are converting to smart cities the unfortunate part is that the city manager or the city ceo has very limited power to make anything smart you need to have several other Uh, uh not just electricity or the land or the the physical infrastructure in the city many other things which support that in terms of one electricity in terms of communication which is the uh, uh internet and the telecommunication and transportation one of the main transportation is railways and uh, another one are the national highways none of them are under the command and control of the city manager or the city ceo the city ceo is a glorified post today and the communication and railways are managed by the central government electricity is managed by the state government and the, uh, the national highways are managed by the state so no. one of the major constraint of the smart city later you can edit it and connect it so i'll start somewhere in between where the connection went up no. so as i said the railways and the telecommunication are managed by the central government the federal government the electricity supply and the state highways and are all managed by uh, the state government and when it comes to the city government they have very limited power very limited income and hence uh, the smart city development has its own challenges so whatever has been done now in many of the smart cities are some of the i ict related activities command and control center and some physical infrastructure like uh, better roads and better water supply and 
better electricity and all that. So power alone is not going to be a, electricity alone is not going to be a constraint in making the city smarter. We have been advocating that there's a great uh, uh, con confluence and convergence of many of the services which are pro today provided by uh, uh, different uh, uh, agencies which are under the control of different governments within the country need to come together. So we have to change some major laws, both at the federal level as well as at the state level, so that the city governments are empowered. The city CEO has a control on all which is happening in the city. There is an owner for everything, all the services in the city, so that all this can happen. Power alone is not going to be a constraint. And uh, we have been advocating that uh, electricity distribution companies in these smart cities uh, have certain amount of automation and digital assets, which can be a anchor infrastructure, which can be extended at marginal cost to other infrastructure services. For example, the automation system of the electricity distribution network, like the SCADA, DMS, all those things, smart metering, communication system, et cetera, can be extended to water distribution system, city gas distribution system, the traffic light management, uh, the security cameras, all that can sit on one communication and one sit control center. And electricity companies, every city has a 24-7 call center. We even have a four-digit number, which is a 1912, which is a call center all across India, same number. So that can be expanded at marginal cost to be the, the command and control center for the city and many other applications, a digital map, which is available with the electricity distribution company, which uh, capture the, all the buildings, road and the electrical asset that can be shared with other infrastructure service providers. So all this, uh, which is currently there with the electricity distribution companies can be expanded to other domains at marginal cost. And that can be the fastest way at the least cost to build smarter cities. So we yes. had actually published, I, India Smart Grid Forum had published a white paper in this regard in 2014, the smart grid as anger infrastructure for smart cities, which has been uh, uh, accepted around the world. And IEEE has started a series of conferences called Smart Grids for Smart Cities. So we are uh, advocating that in India, smart cities as well. That's fantastic, uh, sir. Thanks for the insight on that. Uh, I just wanted to get into the reforms that have been undertaken by the government across diverse sectors. The power sector, uh, in all its diverse platforms, uh, electricity, renewable, and uh, EV, so on and so forth, is one example. Uh, with all these reforms that are now being enacted and uh, with the focus also moving to the power sector, where would you say that the country would be in, say, the next decade from now? And uh, will this aid India's ambitions and propel India into the new economic fast track for prosperity? I see many, uh, the latest development which are happening in the positive direction. So one of them is on the privatization part. So this government is very keen that electricity distribution, which majorly remains with the state governments all across the country, except in big cities like uh, Delhi, Bombay, Calcutta, uh, Ahmedabad, etc. Most part of India, electricity distribution is still uh, controlled by the state state government, which is going to be privatized on fast track. We have already issued, yesterday, we issued a RFP for Chandigarh, Chandigarh Electricity Department. It's a union territory. So it will be followed by another five uh, union territories very soon, and then followed by some states. So we have done several rounds of reforms of the distribution utilities in last two decades, three, four rounds of huge investment from federal government in terms of uh, grant and subsidies and bailouts also, three or four rounds of bailouts also, but still their economic situation as well as the financial health, as well as the physical infrastructure uh, remains in not so good situation all across the country. So one of the main reason is, uh, it's not the ownership, it's the management. In many states, this state government owned distribution companies are poorly managed, very poorly managed, I must say. Uh, I have been around, as I said, around the world. I have seen utilities which are owned by government, which are very well managed. So I always say 
ownership and management are different and some of the very well managed organizations in india are also in public sector we have dpc we have ongc we have bhcl we have our iims and our all indian institute of medical science we have so many institutions which are world class but when it comes to some of the other poorly managed organizations it is is there in private sector as well as in government sector and electricity distribution companies majority of them are in very poorly managed and uh, the reason being uh, these are owned by state governments which are run by cocktail of uh, political parties whose uh, uh, the, the agenda is winning the next election nobody has a long term 2030 2040 or 2050 vision so that and i don't see a scenario that any time soon state governments will have such a long term vision and a long term agenda in infrastructure development or in transformation of the utilities so privatization is the only uh, 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 way forward and i believe this uh, government has they understood that and taking step seriously so by 2030 as you asked me i feel i believe that at least 50% of india you will see electricity distribution companies in private uh, sector and uh, it it is managed uh, much better so you've been working in the current administration now uh, would you uh, share with us a few experiences on how it is to work uh, with the current administration obviously the view is that everything seems to be on a very proactive scale uh, and it's just a question of finding the right people for the right jobs in order to further the government's uh, progressive agenda uh, what what is your view on this i completely agree with that and uh, government been very proactive uh, particularly uh, the senior leadership uh, uh, many of the things are driven by the prime minister himself particularly on the uh, energy side he is very passionate about renewable energy he had uh, personally uh, driven this program of 175 gigawatt of uh, renewable energy in 2010 india announced that in, at copenhagen in 2009 india announced that a, a, a voluntary commitment of uh, emission reduction by 20% by 2020 and we said that we will have 20000 megawatt of solar power by 2020 so that was only 20000 megawatt uh, but uh, after 2014 uh, prime minister modi he said that 20000 is very less we should have 200000 megawatt of renewable energy by 2020 and with uh, bureaucracy and uh, other uh, leadership said that it's not possible it would be 200 billion dollar the grid cannot uh, integrate so much of renewable energy all kind of excuses the decision I mean, the, the um, utility and bureaucracy given but prime minister did not budge and finally he made them agree that 175 gigawatt of renewable energy by 2022 and that program is going very well and we already achieved more than 80 gigawatt of renewable energy as we speak and uh, we will be somewhere close to 150 to 160 by 2022 and that is also because of covid otherwise we would have been closing 200 by 2022 the projects which are already awarded and in progress and solar energy it uh, the price of solar energy has come down uh, in 2010 11 we started with large solar farms at 17 rupees 60 paise per kilowatt hour and that came down to uh, 11 rupees the next year and now we are at 2 rupees 40 paise 2 rupees 50 paise per unit of uh, generation from large solar farms it's cheaper than coal or any other uh, a, a form of generation last 3 years 2008 17 18 19 we we have added more renewable energy capacity than the coal capacity and we see that uh, no more new coal capacity will be created and there will be more uh, clean energy and uh, also integration of that with grid we have done a lot of things we have very good energy cooperation programs going on with the usa with uk with uh, germany with japan many countries and uh, all these programs energy cooperation programs have helped us in what policies and technologies and programs have worked well what did not work and and that we are going emulating here and uh, helping us in integration of uh, this massive renewable energy portfolio into the traditional grid and 
a transition to the cleaner grid. The government is committed and we hope uh, there will be no change in the, uh, the path which is uh, laid out. Thank you, sir. Sir, a lot of external uh, companies, external entities, they now are looking at India with a lot of interest. Obviously, they are seeing that the economy is uh, re-energizing itself, manufacture, and they're looking at the power sector as a very, very key sector uh, with uh, the reforms announced by the government to come and be a part of it. Uh, so we are having an alternative energy, sodium ion, lithium ion, uh, other uh, power uh, entities who want to come into India and set up uh, their, their uh, presence here to do business. Uh, what is your uh, advice to these uh, entities who are looking at India in a very, very ambitious manner? We are the largest uh, market uh, outside of China today. Uh, we have the greatest opportunity in India. Uh, when I go around the world, I tell, tell all uh, new technology providers, inventors, entrepreneurs, come to India. We give you opportunities to test your technology on the real grid. In your country, your grid operators will not allow you to put your new solution on the grid. You come here, I will allow, I will get you to the real grid and try your solution. It's the greatest opportunity here. The, and the, the biggest thing is that the business case, we still have in nationally a close to 80 to 20 percentage of our electricity pumped into the network is lost. A, a good percentage of it is technical losses and some portion of it is commercial loss, theft, etc. So all solutions have a much better business case in India than in any other part of the world. So what expanding the visibility of the electricity flow in real time so that we exactly know what is lost where, is it a technical loss, is it a commercial loss, and arresting, uh, uh, adopting appropriate solutions and policies to arrest such losses. And those technologies have more relevance here. And I often tell, and many people from different countries have come and done their pilot projects here, and they are all uh, uh, finding very good opportunities here. So this is the biggest market and we are, uh, our, our utilities, although I, I earlier I told about the utilities are not managed properly at the same time, we are very good engineers and they are all open to try new technologies. That's a management problem, but on the technology side part of it, people are op open, they are capable, they understand technology and we are willing to experiment and we are willing to adopt new technologies and we have a better business case uh, the return on investment for me, if, if any new technology, if I, if I spend $100 million if I, in, in one state, if, where I can bring down my transmission distribution losses by 2%, 3%, my return on investment is less than two years. That kind of business case you don't find in many other places. So with the open arms, we welcome all new technologies to, uh, for, for transforming our grid to cleaner, uh, more efficient grid, which will give reliable, clean energy to billions of people. Sir, my final question to you is about renewable energies. Uh, it has become a very, very uh, powerful mantra across the rest of the world. Our prime minister also has made a lot of commitments. India is poised to embrace this technology. It has already embraced it in many ways and forms, but perhaps in many ways and forms, uh, I, my personal opinion is that maybe we have still have a long way to go. Uh, but you are the man in the field. You are the man who is making the, looking at the reality as it exists in front of you. Uh, what do you think uh, needs to be done for a complete cultural and uh, operational shift to embrace this new form of alternative energy for India? So uh, we have been uh, driving a mission to unleash a revolution, a rooftop solar power revolution in the country. So for most categories of customers today, rooftop solar has become economically attractive. As I said, the middle class and uh, uh, high income class, those who consume more than 500, 700 units of electricity a month, they pay seven to 10 rupees per unit of electricity. But generating it from your own uh, rooftop solar is less than five rupees today. The cost has come down, but people don't know about it. So it's an awareness. And people also don't know which solar panels to buy, who are the tested and certified installers who will come and install it for me, and how we will 
benefited. These things need to be uh, educated to the people. So sometime early this year, we have published a paper which talks about unleashing a solar rooftop revolution. So one is that I have been personally advocating that every neighborhood appliance store, there should be rooftop PV systems available. Like you go to a store, buy an air conditioner or a washing machine, the store fellow will send his electrician who come and install the washing machine and the air conditioner. The same way, every neighborhood appliance store should have a solar PV system, which he can choose. I go for what price, what size, and his man come and install it for me. That should be made available. And the utilities been uh, a little afraid of uh, giving connection. Although from 2013 to 2016, three years, we worked directly with the regulators in all the states in India. We have a net metering policy in almost all across India. Every consumer today can become a prosumer by law. Every consumer can be a, by law a prosumer, but connections have not been given. In our 175 gigawatt of renewable energy, 40 gigawatt is uh, allocated for rooftop. And that's a category where we have the least progress. We have achieved only about 10% of that. So we are advocating that. This is something which can grow much bigger, provided people have awareness, people know uh, who will come and install it, and uh, it is economically advantageous for them. So that's one part of it. So uh, another thing for the utility to be, become a revenue neutral, we have been working with the regulators and in the largest state in India, UP, Uttar Pradesh, I, IEGF is now doing a, a, a trial of peer-to-peer -peer trading of solar rooftop electricity through blockchain, through smart contracts established on blockchain. We partnered with a technology blockchain technology company from Australia and we have just commissioned this uh, pilot project and this involved only very few uh, 15 uh, prosumers and consumers and but already there is an interest in uh, utilities in Delhi and other parts of the country they want to do that so we see in next three to five years uh, almost uh, uh, a large percentage of middle class and uh, uh, upper income class communities having rooftop electricity and a large number of people trading it themselves and utilizing the same utility wire and uh, utility generating alternate income from uh, the, the, trans the billing charges and uh, billing and settlement systems, etc. You had asked in between about the pandemic and how the, uh, the distribution companies are surviving in the pandemic. So this is an often asked question to me. One of the biggest change which has happened after the pandemic and the lockdown is that people, those who used to spend typically less than 12 hours at home, are today spending 24 hours at home or, or much larger hours at home. And for the utilities, their high paying customers, which are the industries and commercial enterprises, their load has come down and the residential load has gone up. And for the average citizen, his electricity consumption because he's sitting at home and using all kinds of appliances, including air conditioner, his monthly consumption has gone up Consequently, his bill also has gone up. And on the other side, for a large section of the customers, their income has come down. Many people are experiencing pay cuts. So income has come down, monthly electricity bill has gone up. And for the utility, their income has come down because of the commercial and industrial consumption has come down. And residential cons consumers are to a certain extent as uh, cross-subsidized in India. It's a very, very difficult classic conundrum. <laughs> So how to come out of that? Recently, even last week in one of the state regulatory commission advisory committee meeting, this whether to increase the tariff or not, there was a major debate going on. So I was, I've been a member of that committee in, in many states. So I suggested that what tariff increase you can do is 2%, 5%, 10%. You can't increase the tariff more than that. Even if you increase 5%, 10%, it's a huge load on the average man, average common citizen. And expense reduction, how much cost reduction a utility can do? Not much, very little. The room for both 
tariff increase as well as cost reduction is very limited but what then at the same time without reliable supply of electricity nothing can do including the health services even this dialogue which we have we could not have done without reliable supply of electricity so we need it we need the discom to be uh, surviving so the what is the way out the discom need to look at alternate income uh, avenues there are a, they are sitting on a gold mine of physical and digital assets how can you unlock those physical and digital assets for alternate revenue streams for example customer data is a very important thing all the citizens in the country are electricity customers and their complete data is with them you can share it with the city gas distribution people water distribution people the other uh, uh, commodity sales people appliance sale people they can get into selling energy efficient appliances utilities themselves can sell rooftop solar things they have a very good skilled uh, people who can take over the maintenance of large buildings and commercial complexes so there are a lot of things which they can do and also they, the the cooling as a service they can get into cooling as a service the district energy systems district cooling systems it's, so there are a lot of things uh, uh, they could do we will be doing a webinar on this and they're releasing a white paper on this the new or revenue streams for discoms uh, how to improve their revenue uh, rather than looking at improving increasing the tariff so very soon uh, isgf will be announcing a webinar and we will be releasing a white paper where we will be talking about unleashing uh, or unlocking their digital and physical assets so many of these utilities have very large land parcels with a large substations and they can convert those substations into digital substations or uh, the the gas insulated substations about 70 to 80% of the land becomes free and all those lands are in uh, urban areas which are actually uh, commercial if if you can commercialize those lands that can pay for not only converting this uh, air insulated substation to gas insulated digital substations that can also pay for many other uh, grid modernization activities in the uh, many states so a, a whole lot of things you will see many of our new initiatives new white paper similarly electric cooking is something which we are actively promoting the electricity has reached every home and there is no need for uh, uh, we, we we provide uh, gas cylinders to millions of people hundreds of millions of people so last year we handled 100 1500 million gas cylinders just imagine tra uh, transporting them and taking the empty cylinder back say, refilling and giving it back to people it's a major major energy inefficient and uh, economically expensive activity electricity is already there in every house and we have a variety of large variety of uh, cooking appliances the cooking can be done for, with electricity and even today uh, the rural india more than 60% of the people are using firewood and uh, 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 kerosene and cow dung even in urban india 10 15% of people use firewood or kerosene for cooking so we will we believe that we will not be able to meet our uh, the, the ndc targets by 2030 unless we reduce pollution from cooking that's one of the major pollutant so electric cooking is the way forward so this district energy system electric cooking and electric transportation electric vehicle which government is very keen on we have a mission already announced on electric transportation so electric vehicle and its integration with the grid and electric vehicles which is uh, connected to the grid which can support the grid grid integrated vehicles that's a giv that's the latest term which we use which are uh, providing a variety of grid services ancillary services the battery of the vehicle can supply Uh, electricity back to the grid and that is one way of uh, uh, smoothening the generation from rooftop solar both electric vehicles and the rooftop solar are connected to the low voltage grid the variation in the solar generation during the day can be mitigated or smoothened by the electric vehicle which are also plugged on to the same feeder at the low voltage level 
So these are all going to change. So 2030, I see a, a really different grid where people are having more cleaner energy, affordable, and not having to use uh, or standby arrangements like DG set and inverters and uh, voltage stabilizers. We are well onto that journey and we believe we will be able to achieve that with support from the international community and through our energy cooperation with the UK, USA, Japan, Germany, Norway, a variety of countries. And the experience in India, what we have done right is a lesson and eye opener for other developing countries in South Asia, Southeast Asia, and in Africa. They all can learn a lot from what we have done, including policy making in a multi-party democracy. Thank you, thank you very much. And thank you very much uh, for, for this session with us. We really learned a lot.